muchas gracias Andrés, es, es un honor estar aquí. Uh, yo tengo que empezar en español. Está bien. Um, I, I, I have to say this in, English, in Spanish because it's my native language. And um, I do think that there is a, an effort so, uh, uh, of trying to do it in English. Please excuse my English. Um, I normally begin these issues saying that no, uh, I'm a, a foreign service, I'm a member of the Foreign Service of Ecuador. I'm a, I'm a, I, I have been at this for many time, for, uh, for a long time. Sometimes looking at your faces maybe before you were born. Um, I have been a diplomat for, for more than 40 years and I have in my reincarnations been ambassador to different places, but I've learned also that the thinking patterns between me, an Ecuadorian, uh, a lawyer, a Catholic, a, uh, which is a, common, a commonality between your, uh, Mediterranean Europeans and Latin Americans, is that we deduce. We use fundamentally deductive reasoning while Anglo-Saxons induce. And many times when we talk about the same things we might agree with, sometimes when we write them, we disagree on them because we come from different venues. Um, that's just a, just a statement of, of beginning with this allocation because I, I'm here to talk about my country. I'm very honored that, that, uh, that uh, Andres Ramirez had invited us for, for the end. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry that Congressman Engel got caught up in Ireland, but if one gets caught up in anywhere, maybe Ireland is one of the best places to get <laughs> caught up. Uh, he uh, he uh, led a Codel to Ecuador uh, uh, a few months back, and we're, we were extremely happy by that initiative. We just had another one in Ecuador last week, f uh, fundamentally visiting the scientific advances in the, in the Galapagos. Um, and we, 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 we keep on uh, trying to, to uh, have a, an, a very ample dialogue with different sectors, not only of the United States, but of the world. I, I have 15 minutes, but I, I, I was planning on doing it very, very shortly on, on an introduction between what I believe is, is, is important. I am, like I said, I'm a professional diplomat. When I began this, I was a utopian and an idealist. I really believed that the Charter of the United Nations was the world mandate of, uh, of, uh, of foreign policy and foreign relations. Um, as I have aged, I become more of a realist than maybe a cynic. And therefore, I have, to, I have to agree that interests prevail in foreign policy. And in many cases, those interests conflict, or in many cases, those interests are not the same. And sometimes the best way of getting over this issue is agreeing that we disagree. And sometimes the best way of disagreeing is to know exactly where you're positioned on these issues in order to understand where you're coming from. And also that, the, that politics is an evolving process, an evolving process in which we, as diplomats in the United States, look into how your system works in a very, a very detailed way. Um, uh, before going into Ecuador, I would like to explain the challenges for uh, an Ecuadorian ambassador in the United States. Uh, if I were serving in any other country, I would probably go to the, the Ministry of Foreign Relations of France or Italy or uh, Ecuador or Brazil and can hand them in a note and say extension of ATPDA and SGP is, 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 is valuable for both countries for this reasoning. Uh, when I do that, they tell me, um, when I go to state and say this, and they tell me, have you talked to the White House? Have you gone up to Congress? Have you lobbied Congress? Have you made your case to the think tanks? How about the media? Have you worked with the NGOs? How about the ecology part? How about the labor part? So, uh, so fundamentally, a diplomat in the United States from a small country like mine meets a gigantic challenge of going up to your House of Representatives and having 435 members of them, but with five or 10 staffers, very knowledgeable, like Eric here, uh, on the issues. Uh, and it is a very challenging issue to try to get to the most of them. Then you have 100 senators with a staff around 100, and then you have the committees. And then you have to convince them that it is valuable for both relations in a multiple dialogue and the reasoning behind the different positions. I have to say that because uh, Ecuador is a small country immersed in the, in, in the world with international relations, not only with the United States, but with more than 100 countries. We have interests in different parts of the world. We have obviously uh, traded with many of them, but we also have political interests with others. Ecuador is an oil exporting country. It's been an oil exporting country since 73, and it will continue to be an oil exporting country for the next few decades, until the natural resource, of course, or either you find new resources or you deplete them. 
but in, a, in an economy that is $140 a barrel today and $4 a gallon, we, we think that it might be very possible that the $200 mark might be met someday. We didn't think that five or six years away, and that is, is a major concern to us. How you develop an energy policy, both the consumers and demand, are, are, are one, of our major, one of our major issues. Ecuador has had a prolonged history during the last 30, 30 years of instability. In my personal reasoning, it is due to dictatorship was that, that were dictatorships that broke the backbone of institutionalization of democracies in Ecuador and brought in the military to solve the problems. Uh, during the last 10 years, Ecuador has, been, has had presidents of two and a half years each, which has meant a very big challenge of stability for the country. And what we're trying to do is normalize and progress into a more permanent venue of institutionalization. Um, when, we, when we talk about these issues, we also talk about what Ecuadorians would wish. Uh, and fundamentally, there is a very big list of what Ecuadorians think, and this is polling fundamentally and, uh, and, 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 and calculations on what, what they want. They want, a, they want stability. They want security. They want, uh, they want to be able to provide for their families and their children with education and health. Ecuador is a 12 million population. Half of it is under 19. Half of it is under the poverty line. I have to find employment for more than 150 young people every year. Or either they go into other, other issues, which is migratory issues fundamentally for Ecuador, because we're the only country in the Andean region that doesn't produce coca and uh, coca leaves, and therefore we are the only zero country in the area that can say that. Uh, we have been very successful in doing that, both because of our policing the issue, but also of giving our, our social networks the employment they need for that. Um, Ecuador, during these last years, has looked for a, a way to decrease poverty levels. And that is a very complicated issue because you go into culture, education, and others. And we've had to confront and, uh, a conundrum between trade policies that will make you grow and the, the realities, the indigenous realities of the Ecuadorian, of the Ecuadorian farmers. I have a minority in Ecuador, an important minority in Ecuador, which is indigenous. I'll give you an example of that because I think it's valuable in a sense. When I was a young man, many like you, your ages, I, I had a small farm and I wanted to build a, a, I wanted to fix a barn and I asked the foreman who was an Indian to cut the trees and I would be there by Saturdays to cut, to, to cut the trees and build a farm. And when I got there on, on Saturday, they, were, they weren't cut. And I was, very I, I was very angry because of that, being young and not knowledgeable about these things. I asked, why didn't you cut them? And he said, that the, the moon. The moon is in the place to cut the trees. So what the moon has to, to do with this thing, come on, you didn't cut the trees and so on. But I asked because I was taught that you had to be very respectful with the culture of indigenous populations because they got this from somewhere. They learned it from somewhere. And this individual who had gone to school for th uh, to the third grade knew this because of oral tradition. He had a culture that knew that the savia of the tree, when you cut it in certain phases, rots before. How do you learn that? Oral tradition, culture. That's the difference between education and culture, between reading Shakespeare and knowing Beethoven and, and having an ingrained culture. And I have many of these groups in Ecuador who believe that uh, transgender, generic uh, seeds or depletion of use of, uh, of insecticides or, 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 uh, or fungicides will, will cause grave damage. And they've been subject to pollution in the Amazon and they've learned through 500 years of, of exploitation that they need to preserve the earth. So we are dealing with a multiple ethnic society with many ingrained values, with many types of thinking because they are also, they also have another cosmovision. And that is what Ecuador is about. It's a, it's a multi-ethnic, pluralistic country, uh, multi-regional country with different climates that has to look after what, uh, what, it's, what, it, what it is about and how, they vis how the vision of the future will, will act. Fundamentally, uh, when, when you talk about the Ecuadorian process, you're talking about a constant looking for the, the search of truth in a, in a very democratic process. In Ecuador, we have not killed ourselves. In Ecuador, we might disagree, we might topple governments, but we do not have blood on the streets here. We have done this through our mechanisms. Many of them can be criticized by ourselves, but this has been going on in what is a multiple, a multiple issue. Now at the present, um, Mr. Correa, Rafael Correa, the president of, the, uh, of Ecuador, 
He was, up till three years ago, I would purely state, a, a college professor. He, is, he was educated in Lovina, met his wife, is a, married to a Belgium, has three children. Did his apostolate in, uh, in, as, uh, in, in the Indian communities of Sumbawa, speaks Quechua. Very few Ecuadorians in the middle class speak Quechua and understand this cosmovision difference between the, Indian, the indigenous. Um, he, he doctored in pure economics from Illinois, so he, 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 he can speak French and English, uh, Quechua and Spanish. His, uh, he's a success story. He went, uh, probably 30, 30 months ago, nobody knew him. Uh, he became Minister of Finance and he has become the President of Ecuador with a tremendous backing of the Ecuadorian people who want a change. And that change, as geared by the pro proposal of his party, is a, a constitutional assembly. This constitutional assembly is open to every debate possible. So we have an, an ongoing debate which will probably end in the sequence in these next few months and we'll have a constitution which has to be submitted to referendum. Um, most of the people there uh, in, in this constitutional assembly are your age. They are members of academia, they are members of NGOs, they are members of social society. They are not traditional members of the parties. The parties uh, received a, a very bad vote in, 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 the, in the last elections, fundament, fundamentally because persons distrusted them because of the levels of corruption. Those are statistics. I'm repeating what, what the statistics say on, this, on these issues. But what what are we looking for in, 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 in this context? Well, first of all, we're looking for the solution to, a so, to our social problems. And the re-engineering of the, of, the, of the state apparatus, the state government, which has entered, which was par uh, partially uh, driven by interest in the sense that they were segmented between the parties, and this led to a, a high level of corruption. Efficiency. We're looking for more efficiency in the state held uh, in the, in, uh, of, of the state, and a view that the state has to be responsible for those issues that it should be responsible for. Giving health, giving education, giving good education and excellence in education, gearing to, gearing to the solution of the, uh, of the problems in the context of a very dynamic world. Because the oil prices, we export oil, but the oil prices at 140 barrels, we import derivatives. We are de derivados, not derivatives, derivados. Uh, oils and different issues that we do not produce or refine in Ecuador. Uh, we also have a very, a very complex issue of fertilizers and the others, because as they shoot up, the prices of our food are going up. The prices of our food, we, we buy 95% of our wheat outside, and we were buying it from the United States. The increase of prices in, in foodstuffs has been very, co very complex, because you've changed your, your, corn, your wheat into corn and, uh, and soy to, for ethanol. Uh, uh, plus the natural disasters, which both you have had in Iowa, and I'm very sorry that it was Iowa. I sent a letter to, to Senator Grasley on this issue of the flooding and so on. So we've also had very grave uh, floodings in our coastal region. Climate change is affecting us all and is provoking natural disasters which uh, were unprecedented in our areas. All this has aggregated a situation of, uh, of economy. Ecuador has a very solid economy, but then again, you, you have to look at it from a world perspective of where we're going to in the next few, few months or years. We are very knowledgeable about uh, a process in the United States, which is an electoral process. You're in a process that will, uh, that will elect a president in, in, in November. That means that you will have another administration probably in February. Whomever wins will have to put that in place. So, re so during this year, <coughs> uh, these months, we have to be very careful in opening dialogue with all the partners in order to express our opinions. Sometimes our opinions are not that well transmitted or interpreted by media. And we all are all subject to the, to, to the issues of the interpretation of. Uh, we try to be very frank about our positions, very, very clear about what, what our intentions are. We do not, we are not uh, in, in the position of, of being a, a person who tries to do harm to others. We are not in the, p the position of an aggressor. We are fundamentally a peace-loving country. We do not have internal or external conflicts. And we have an agenda that is based fundamentally on the respect for human rights. Um, I myself am uh, a member of the UN Committee Against Torture and Cruel and Other Degrading Treatments. I'm one of the 10 world members elected for that. And I also deal in human rights and disabilities to a long extent. Um, when you look at a country, and uh, I would like you to, to look at mine, 
where, through the eyes of realism for one state, but also in the aspiration that all of us have to have our families and our children in a better place in the world. We have enormous problems that we have to deal with. We hope that we can, uh, we can better the, 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 the situation. But all of these issues are also internationally, <coughs> international, there's an international co-responsibility on this issue. There is an international co-responsibility on everything that is transnational. If you talk about diseases, of course, transnational diseases, HIV and the avian flu will, will be international issues where we need to cooperate. International crime, and uh, international crime has three major offsets, drugs, weapons, and trafficking of women. And when I'm talking about trafficking of women and children, this is what we try to avoid. We also try to avoid weapons, weapons merchandising. We do not support that. We're very, we're, we're very radical in that. And the drug, and the drug war that is, is an Andean trait has been of enormous consequences to us. We have uh, in our brothers Colombia, a country which we admire and which we respect very much, but the consequences of the internal struggle in Colombia have brought half a million Colombians into Ecuador uh, as migrants, 16,000 in refugee units, and we have something like 40,000 petitions to, be more, to have more refugees. That has an impact on our, on our system. We do not have refugee camps. When the UN Special High Commissioner for Refugees went to Ecuador, he saw that they had integrated into our families, into our villages, into our societies. Uh, Ecuador is the, 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 most, uh, the most important recipient of refugees in, in, in the hemisphere at this point. Problems of international context have to deal with food security now. Where are we, how are we going to get food into our tables, which is manageable for, especially for the poor? Because when you're talking about an impact in a $5 economy a day of an increase of one fifty or $2, dollars, you, are, you are condemning people to poverty, but to also to disease and in some cases to disability. Ecuador is one case. I, uh, Africa and maybe other countries are worse off and we have to do our best to try to help them. And we have troops in Africa and we have troops in, in, in Haiti. And we try to, to be helpful in the concern of peacemaking, but also trying to avoid the conflict areas and helping people come out of their poverty, even if we are in a situation of, of that nature. Um, I would like to go into two more aspects fundamentally, and this is, a vision of the future. I think that we have an ongoing dialogue with the United States, which is a very fruitful dialogue. We, we sit down and we discuss those issues in the ample sense of the word, which are, uh, are issues of concern to us in, the, in, in a very multi and multifaceted relationship with the United States, because the United States and us have a multidimensional contact from education to industry, to trade, to, to, to health, all these, Issues interact between each other. And of course, that has a certain level of what other critics say is determinism. We are determined by the problems. And I think that is not reality. Reality is that we should look for the solution of those problems that determine a conduct in order to understand how it, how it works and how it functions, in order to find a, a, a mutually agreeable solution. Maybe we'll agree to disagree which is also a possibility amongst human beings. And what we ask for is mutual respect between us and understanding of where we are in our process of democracy with respect to other process of democracy. Um, the theories of capacity and success of this, uh, of this uh, enterprise are marked by the capacity of the Ecuadorian people to be able to change and have a more holistic and integral society. We are a pluralistic society that has to make significant changes in the way we context the issues of differences in racial origins and problems of poverty in different scales. Uh, with the United States, I have, of course, a long gamma of, of issues. I will only touch on one of them, which is migration. I have talked to you, the leaders of Congress, both in the Senate and in the House, on what I feel is a very complicated issue for us and for the, 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 the Hispanic minority in, in the United States. When I, when I came to school here, nobody would stop another person in the street because it was illegal, because he looked like an Andean Indian or an Ecuadorian, because he, he, he was perceived as being a criminal because he was undocumented. This is a migrant country which has built its resources on that, and there are millions contributing to its economy, which most Americans understand. 
But as you age as a society, as the baby boomers age, you will need more help. And maybe it's better to have people from the same hemisphere and region doing that, not to get into the partialization of legal aspects. Here you, you fail to have a federal, federal legislation, which I'm not saying is the best, but you failed to do it last year. And now I'm having a plethora of legislation by cities, by counties, by, by states which are fundamentally xenophobic and are persecuting migrants that are, that are documented or undocumented. So I have cases every day on, in my desk of ill treatment and violation of human rights, which you call civil liberties here. So I would like to call your attention that this needs to be solved in some way. And you, it may be a debate in the, in the presidential election, but something has to be done in order to solve these problems. Something has to be done to have a more equitable relation of trade, a more beneficial mutual relationship. I cannot retool my Indian population to grow corn as your companies in the Middle East, in the, in the, in the Middle West are growing corn. Those are gigantic conglomerates that are doing that. The small farmers of the United States have disappeared from when I, when I was counsel in, in Illinois some 30 years back. But my people cannot compete with subsidies that between you and the Europeans and Japan are $1.2 billion a day. A day. I could probably pay my foreign debt in eight days with what you are subsidizing your agricultural sector. So it makes it very difficult for me to sit down in front of another and say, free trade and, and subsidy. No, we'll, we'll talk about that later. You have to comply with this. And this is the great dilemma of, the, uh, uh, of Doha and the, and, and the incapacity of arriving at, at a solution. But I'm talking about food for my people. And I'm talking about a change in, in societies and cultures which sometimes make it more difficult for certain, certain societies than others. Um, I'll stop there, I, I'll be open to any question. There are many others, of course, and I'll be trying to be the most frank I can in, 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 in answering them. Uh, but I'd like to leave on a, on, on a positive issue that we have problems and we have to look for solutions for the problems. That's the whole, that's the whole nature of, of a mutual open dialogue. And I think that that part we have with the United States, we have with the United States political establishment, we have it with your Congress, and we're trying to do the best we can in getting our message across with all the limitations a small embassy of five has in Washington. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much.